If you follow the history of any nation, it basically has a cycle. It starts off as uh, little tribes. Eventually, they unite under a central government and have a golden age. And then there's civil war, and they start fighting each other. And uh, eventually, they fall apart and are conquered by a larger civilization, larger empire. This happened to the Babylonians. It happened to the Greeks. It happened to the Persians. And it happened uh, to every other nation, the Romans. It happened to the Jewish people, too. We started out as tribes. We reached a golden age under David and Shlomo. Right after that civil war, we split in half, constant battles until we finally disintegrated and were conquered by Babylonia. And that was the end. Nebuchadnezzar ended the Jewish nation, the Jewish empire. It was over. The miracle of the Jews is that we came back. Why? Because during the Purim story, we recommitted ourselves to HaKadosh Baruch Hu and to the Torah. Yeah. Kimu v'kiblu, kimu masha kiblu kfar. We reestablished the Torah stronger than we did at Har Sinai. And we came back and we built another base of Mikdash and we built another country and built another. And we remained true to our mission until we didn't remain true to our mission and then we were destroyed by the Romans. And then we reappeared in Bavel and we reached, you know, the, the period of the great yeshivas. And Bavel was destroyed. And so they made their way to Spain. And Spain had the golden era. And then it disintegrated and fell apart. And this has been the story of the Jews throughout history. But we keep reappearing. You know why? Because at some point we wake up and we say, okay, what does it mean to be a Jew? What does it mean to be a Jew? That's, a, that's, a, that's an important question. And if we stop being Jews, so two stories. One story I heard from David Lukens when he was the Jewish affairs advisor to Senator Patrick Moynihan. He tells the story. Um, Patrick Moynihan, the Irish senator, came to meet with Shimon Perez to thank him for supporting Asia Torah Fellowship Program. <laughs> the Irish Catholic is thanking the Jewish minister for supporting a Torah program. And Shimon Perez told him, I'll always support any program that teaches about Judaism. And I'll tell you why. He says, when I was young, I joined uh, the Communist Party. And the Zionist Party, I was a communist Zionist. I was going to come to Israel and make a, make a Jewish state based on communist principles. The early Labor Party was basically communist. They, they celebrated May Day and everything. That's why in, in, when they had the UN vote for the partition, Russia and all of the Warsaw Pact countries voted in favor of Israel because they were sure it was going to be a communist country. He says, so someone brought me to the Chavetz Chaim. And he said to me, go to Israel and build your state. But just remember, you can't have a Jewish state without Judaism. He says, and the older I get, the more I realize that me and my friends were wrong. And that old rabbi was right. You can't have a Jewish country without Judaism. Yeah. That's story one, number one. Story number two is after the Yom Kippur War, Ariel Sharon came to America and he was speaking around and he spoke in my school, Hebrew Academy of Nassau County. He spoke in Hebrew, so most people had no idea what he was saying, <laughs> to be perfectly frank. But he kept throwing in this phrase, Ani lo dati aval, Ani lo dati aval. I'm not religious, but I'm not religious, but. Fine. So uh, I had a friend at the time who uh, was above average intelligence. Yeah. And he had, uh, 
he had become uh, very religious. And this rankled him. So when it came time for the question and answer, he answered in English because he wanted to make sure that all the students could hear. He said, General, what gave us the right to take this land away from the Arabs who were living there? Arab Sharon was surprised by the question. He said, Katuv Torah, that this land was given to us by, uh, to, was given by God to Aaron Yitzhak and Yaakov. He said, well, if your uh, claim to the land is based on the Torah, how could you say Anilo Dati? How could you say I'm not religious? Well, everybody understood that this was a affront to this general who was a war hero. Right, Fendel was saying, okay, let's just, you know, end the questioning now, you know. And everybody was yelling, they don't know what to do, you know. And above the fray, Rabbi Yaakov Whale, my Rebbe, who was Makari, his voice was booming above everybody else's saying, let him answer, let him answer. <laughs> Finally, everything quiets down and he gave the following answer. Sheila tova en tshuva. There is no answer to explain why we fulfilled this dream of coming back to the land of Israel. Herzl, who had no connection to Judaism, when they offered him Madagascar, he was just as happy to take Madagascar. He didn't care. He didn't see any particular connection to Israel, per se, because he didn't have any connection to Judaism. So you just want a country, take that country. No difference. Yeah. But if you claim that I write to the land is because of the Torah. Mishnah and Pirkei Avos. Pirkei. Mishnah Beis. Asara Doras may Odom v'yad Noach lahodiyah kame erech apayim lefanov. There were 10 generations from Adam to Noach to teach you how much patience God has. All of the generations came and made him angry till he brought the flood. Mishnah Gimel. There were 10 generations of Noach to Avram to show you how much patience God has. Now it should end with some terrible destruction. So Avram came and got everyone's reward. Which means Noah was not able to save his generation from the flood. He couldn't do it. Avraham did what Noah couldn't do. He saved the world. He managed to bring it back together. The Chazal say like a tailor sews two pieces of cloth together. He sewed together Shemaim Va'aretz. He managed to bring back together the connection between the world and God. Noah couldn't do that. He saved himself. He saved his family. But he couldn't, but he couldn't save the generation. Avram was able to save everybody. He was able to become the new source of creation. As the Torah says, Behibaram, mix up the letters and it says, Ba'avraham. Avraham was able to save the world and recreate it. What does that mean? That means when you watch society disintegrate, you get a choice. You could be Noah or you could be Avraham. You can save yourself or you can save your generation. Now, I'm not here to judge Noah. It's a, it's a machlekes. Tzadik B'dorosov, was he a tzadik only in his generation? And in Abraham's generation, he would not have counted for anything. It's interesting that at the Dor Haflaga, when they were building Big Del Bovel, both Avraham and Noach was there. And Avraham was called Avraham Ha'ivri because he was on one side and the whole world was on the other side. But it doesn't say anything about Noah. He wasn't even a player. So, uh, so when you have a situation like that, you have to ask yourself, okay, what happens now? Who am I going to be? We are watching a disintegration of society that is incomprehensible. 
And here in Israel, the level of hatred towards religion, hard to remember when it was so hateful. Now, okay, the early Zionists, there were a lot of them, uh, Moshe Dayan, the Six-Day War, war hero, his parents on their kibbutz used to hang a loaf of bread outside of their door in Pesach. You know, okay. But for the most part, Pesach was Pesach. Shabbos was Shabbos. They weren't fighting for public transportation. They understood Shabbos is Shabbos. Yom Kippur, even secular Jews wouldn't drive on Yom Kippur. They understood Yom Kippur had a certain thing. And now we see people attacking people who are davening on Yom Kippur. We see people attacking people who are just trying to be religious. What happened? Where's that generation? Now, be perfectly clear, and that's one of my problems, you know, is that sometimes, you know, there are these people who have figured out how to make money off of my podcast. I haven't. <laughs> but, you know, they'll take little clips of mine and they'll put it up and they'll get 50 sponsors and make a, you know, make thousands of dollars. I don't get anything out of it. But anyway, but it'll take a little clip. And the problem when you take a little clip is it's out of context. You don't know what's going on. So someone might just take that little clip and say, oh, Reverend Lowski is saying it's because the secular people are attacking the religious. That's why this is happening. No, I'm not saying that. When people came to the Brisk of Rav in the early years of the state and were complaining about the Zionists and complaining about the, uh, uh, the non-religious, he said, why are you looking at them? That, that They're not the issue. Yona Hanavi is on a boat surrounded by Ovde Avodah And we know that Avodah makes God angry. And there's this big storm. And they're trying to figure out why it's happening. And Yona says, eh, it's not doing you people, it's only because of me. Who do you think a Kodesh Baruch was looking at at this moment? Only us. There's a story that apparently is well known. I only heard it today. Apparently it's well known. And someone said to Reb Meisha, oh, you should daven because there was a, you know, a Jewish kid on a bicycle who got hit, uh, you know, got hit in the road. He, he's there now because it can't be. He says, no, look, look, he's, he, this, this kid with a yarmulke is lying in the street because no, it can't be. So they go out and it's some Hispanic who stole the yarmulke from a Jewish kid. He used to go around and steal the yarmulkes from Jewish kids. You know, I was wearing it as I was riding his bicycle. Reb Meisha said, no Jewish kid could get hit from a bicycle outside of my window. You think I would let that happen? If an accident happens, it's because of me. I could stop it. If something like this happens, there's no place to look other than at ourselves. I'm not looking at anybody else. This is a tragedy the likes of which we have not seen 40 years. Yom Kippur War happened on Yom Kippur. This happened on Shemini Atzeris. It's devastating. Devastating. So what do we do? So what do we do? I heard people saying the following, Kol Kol Yaakov, Yudayim Day Esav, and uh, giving a whole vote on that. It doesn't help over here because this is not Esav. This is Yishmael. This is Yishmael. Rabbi Moshe Shapiro explained that when you go up against Yishmael, Yishmael is coming with two weapons. One is in his name, Yishmael. God will hear his voice. They daven. Went to a gas station here and there was a Muslim behind the coke. I just wanted to pay. I couldn't pay because he was had his little prayer rug and he was, you know, doing his yikud five times, you know. He was davening, he didn't care. He's going to die. We have to be mechazek our davening because they're davening. You bet that they're davening. And uh, if they daven better than us, so when we fight Esav, we have an advantage because we're coming with two different tools. But here we're coming with the same tool. Koach HaTfila. That's number one. Number two is the Kayach of Yishmael is Masiris Nefesh. 
Yishmael says to Yitzchak, ah, big deal, you had your bris milah at eight days, you had nothing to say about it, it's not so painful. I had mine at 13. And Yitzchak has to respond, if Hashem asked for my entire body, I would give it to him. And that, in fact, is what led to a Kedis Yitzchak, where the Jewish people had to show Yishmael, we have more mysterious nefesh than you. One of these Arab terrorists said, eventually we're going to win this war because we're willing to die for what we believe in and you're not willing to die anymore. You're tired. You've had enough. You don't care. It's the level of Messiris Nefesh, how much we're willing to put in, how much we care. That's going to determine the outcome of the battle with Yishmael. So two things we clearly have to be mechazek ourselves in is when it comes to tefillah and how seriously we take our Judaism. My son was at a kennis at the Mir, and they said the following. This is what the Rosh Yeshiva of the Mir said in Yerushalayim. They said, the Chazal tell us that when Shabbos is Rosh Hashanah, it's going to be a bad year. Why? Because uh, we didn't blow shofar. And when we blow shofar on Rosh Hashanah, Hashem moves from the Kisei Adin to the Kisei Arachim. He moves from the throne of judgment to the throne of mercy. So if you don't have that in a year where you don't blow shofar. So, uh, so he says, what we need to do is be Mechazek Shabbos. So they saw the Zman early and they're doing Suvis. So if you know Suvis, you know, they, they skipped ahead to the Shabbos Sugis. And uh, they're going to be having different people speaking about Shabbos and learning Hilcha Shabbos. And there's always going to be a group in the base measures doing Hilcha Shabbos. So we can for sure for ourselves be mischazek our Shmir Shabbos. Shabbos Beratius. You know, after all of the holidays, you know, we had Shabbos Rosh Hashanah, we had Shabbos Sukkah, Shabbos Shmini Yatzeris, had Shabbos Shuvah. Now we have Shabbos, Shabbos Bereshit, the first regular Shabbos. All of the regular stuff is there. Let's take this Shabbos and Mechazek it and make sure that we put our Shmira Shabbos to the point. But understand, nothing like this happens for no reason, unless you don't believe in God. If you say, why did God do this? Then you're assuming that there is something to do between us and HaKadosh Baruch Hu. If you don't, okay, so it's just... They were smart, they, they practiced, they, they made an attack, it had nothing to do with anything. But if we're believing Jews, then we understand nothing happens for nothing. And when you take a look, and we said, uh, you know, in, uh, in the son of Tokev, me by Eishu, me by Mayim, who this year is going to die by fire, and who by water, and who by cherev, by, by sword, who's going to be captured who's going to be uh, abused and oppressed and all the terrible things that take place. When you, when you see all of this taking place, it's time for us to be mechazek ourselves and to strengthen ourselves. Because at the end of the day, there's nobody else to look at. There's nobody. There's just me. I'm the only one in this world who can take responsibility for what's going on. There's nobody to daven for me. There's nobody to solve this problem. It's going to be us. Every one of us in our own life are going to look down and say, I'm going to become that Jew that can stand up to Yishmael, my tefillah and my Messiris nefesh. And I'm going to take the koyach of Shabbos and I'm going to use that koyach of Shabbos to be able to get us closer to HaKadosh Baruch Hu than Amir Hashem. Nothing can make up for the terrible losses we've had. Hundreds dead thousand wounded, it's, it's mind-boggling. You know, and when you talk about wounded, you know, you talk about people losing limbs, losing this, who knows what. Terrible, terrible things. Mirza uh, Hashem, Kodesh Baruch have Rachmanus on us. And if we come out of this tragedy stronger and better people to be able to make the world a better place, that we're going to try to do the best we can in our own lives to solve this divide between the religious and the real irreligious, between the non-believers and the believers by showing them how strong we are. 
Rabbi Sosalant had told the boys when they were learning in yeshiva, learn shtark so that the Jews in France don't intermarry. It means that if you learn shtark in your base medrash, the ripple effects will be such that at least there'll be enough sense of Judaism that nobody's going to intermarry. So that's what we have to do. We have to work on ourselves and make ourselves so strong that people will look at the firm community and say, yeah, those are the people who are living the lives that make a difference. And in that's chus, we will have a Yeshua and a victory.